now going to hear from Extinction Rebellion and how, in less than two years, the movement has been able to grow into a global decentralized movement. And whilst there are thousands of brand ambassadors for Extinction Rebellion right now, I think we have quite a few in this room. Hands up. The brand identity started somewhere, and it started in 2018, and we are very privileged to have the creators of that brand identity in the room, so I would like to welcome Clive Russell, Miles Glynn, Charlie Waterhouse, and Extinction Rebellion co-founder, Claire Farrell, onto the stage. Thank you. I'm not sure what we're doing. Um, <laughs> is anyone going to ask any questions, or how oh. are we going to work this? <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll just clear my chest. Um, <laughs> thank you. I don't. I, it's just like it's just a congested chest. It's, yeah, it is a Q and A. Yeah, so we, we need that's questions. That's what we were told. But 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 but, but, but we can <laughs> we can but talk like, about my bronchial the, complaints. The essence, that's due to London pollution. The essence of protest is disorganisation. So maybe we can start with like, a de how does a decentralised movement work? It works a bit like what you've just seen. <laughs> I, think, I, I, I think I mean we 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 as a group here all have worked together before coming to Extinction Rebellion. So we were really lucky because we knew each other really well, so we could lean each on each other a lot. Um, so Extinction Rebellion started with about approximately 15 people, um, which is all you need, basically, to change everything. You only need 15 people. So just remember that. <laughs> so, but um, the, the art group itself, um, as I say, we, we worked together for a long time beforehand. And, you know, I mean, it's sort of, I don't know, Miles, Claire, you know, you have a different practice. We are, me and him have worked together for about 20 years. That's why we look the same. It, it, feels, um, it, it feels like longer. <laughs> um, so, so we're graphic designers, but Claire is a fashion designer, Miles is a fine artist. And we brought our two different practices together at a point, but also then we were inspired by a certain Roger Hallam. So I think I'll let Claire... Well, and, and, and many others, actually. Um, do you want me to talk about that? I yeah? would love you okay. to talk about that. Um, <laughs> so, um, I, I was already working with Miles on a project called Body Politic, which was about embodying positive resistance. Um, <laughs> Sometimes it's not always positive. <laughs> um, <The world's> <laughs> um, and uh, and we'd started that as a as a project to to work with clothing and use the body as a as a vehicle for messages and um, a way to start new conversations. And it evolved into a participatory kind of arts project where we would run workshops together. And we collaborated with Charlie and Clive on, on, a, on a small project that they had uh, coming out of Brixton in association with the Brixton Pound, which is a local currency in South London. Um, and, uh, and, and throughout that period of us all working together, I went and uh, met somebody called Roger Hallam, who um, I'd seen on hunger strike at King's College University um, to um, encourage the university to divest from fossil fuels. And um, I believe it was the fastest winning divestment campaign ever that we can find. Um, I think in around from about five weeks of uh, breaking the law, being ejected from the university and going on hunger strike for two weeks, uh, he had a deal on the table. So if anyone's interested in that, by the way, if you want your institution to divest, we've got data on it. It works on universities as institutions. Um, many people have done it subsequently at other UK universities. So I became interested in the sort of pointed nature of the tactics and his research was into how to like design effective radical campaign strategies. So I started working with him and Within a few months, I was trying to get sent to prison. And a few months after that, I was on hunger strike. And then we launched Extinction Rebellion. And um, so obviously, it's, it's been a bit of a whirlwind, because that's quite a small space of time. Actually, it's probably about two and a half years all of that fits into. And do you have a number of how big Extinction Rebellion is now? Um, the how last, many countries? Yeah, the last I've been told is over 70 countries. And um, I think in the UK, we have a a sort of signed up supportive membership of somewhere around 200,000 people. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's fast. It's very fast growth. But I have to say, like, although I um, obviously I'm quite proud of the people that have worked on it and the things that we've got right and some of the stuff we have got right, I also think it's really, unfortunately for everybody, it's a, it's a real sign of the times because, you know, we're, we're pretty fucked, actually. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people were just waiting for permission to do something that felt it was in line with the magnitude of the, of the scale of the threat that we face. I mean, I got super depressed after going to one of your talks. <laughs> I really did. You, you're Great. calling on people to give up hope, you yeah, know? But, but, and I've worked in sustainability, and it's all about hope. But, There's but, a silver bullet solution out but, there. But, 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 that's, but that's one of the secrets, I think, because <laughs> I think if you, once you've given up hope, once you've lost all hope, then you've got nothing else to lose. And that then enables you to kind of make decisions about what you do that you wouldn't have done before. And that's what we need. We need to stop doing what we've done before and do things that we never imagined that we would. So, so I think losing, I think hope is, 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 a, is a distractionary danger in the situation that we face. Well, and hope within the current system is just hope that something can work which won't work. Yeah, so if you need a full or system hope in change, or, then... Sorry. No, it's okay. No, I mean, and also we kind of live in a time when people don't really kind of understand the mortality and the fact that they're going to die and how fragile their lives are. <laughs> and I think there's some link between understanding your fragility and your nearness to your own death, which relates to understanding the, like the magnitude of extinction. And I think, I mean, to follow <laughs> up on that, we, we were asked... <laughs> We did a talk at a university recently, and one of the students said to us, don't you find it a real downer to be constantly talking about death? And the answer to that is, well, aren't you going to die? I mean, because everyone in this room is going to fucking die. You know, that's a basic fact. Um, um, but the one thing we have power over is the space in which we die in. And if we allow that power to be given over to other people, then we have no way of living something that's important in between those two points of our life, which is birth and death. And we are currently not being allowed to have much of a say in that. We, that is being taken away from us. Uh, we live in a society that is being described for us and not by us. And I think it's really important. This is where Extinction Rebellion tries to drive that wedge in and help people to understand that you can make a difference. And that's where the hope begins actually in that wedge that gets driven in, that opens up the space, and that, it, that is where the hope begins. It's quite, oh, I was thinking, it's quite interesting looking at this stuff around us. We're, yeah. we're, we're like four really miserable bastards, aren't we? <laughs> and, uh, but actually all this work, none, uh, pr pr we didn't do any of this. Um, well, I, I don't think we did any of it, really. Um, it's all really kind of joyous and, and kind of looks quite positive as well, which I've always found really interesting. So as I understand it, um you have like a, a centralized brand identity kit that you have created. And also I think, you know, you've created some wood cut, cut designs that anybody can print onto a t-shirt also so you don't hide, like perpetuate mass consumption. You have a brand identity kit that anyone can just use anywhere for any means or what are the limits with that? We don't call it a brand identity kit. We call it a design program and there are no limitations. There's, well, there's three limitations. So there are no limitations, but there are three. <laughs> um, use the logo, use the typeface, use the colours, and everything else is kind of up to you. I mean, the point of this is to create an evolving scheme and to be able to give it away. Because the point of this is that it doesn't reside with ourselves, it resides with everyone else. Um, we're not going to tell people how to make what this becomes next. That will be made by other people. And that was really important. Just seeing these red rebels turn up, I mean, that would started off with a couple of people in Bristol, didn't it? And like so a what's sort of the concept behind the red rebels? <sighs> That's it. It's, yeah. they, they were born out of a, a small group of theatre practitioners and one person in particular called Dougie who, who really pushed it forwards in the beginning. And they wanted to make a performance that was able to represent the blood of the blood of dead animals, the blood of extinct species, the blood of life that's running through us whilst we are still alive. And um, 
and what these people do when they're in, in, a, in a rebellious space, when they're in an occupied space, um, is partly, I think, to uh, come and bear witness, um, which, is, which is a major piece of what they represent. But because of the way that they behave, they, they move um, silently um, around. It has this kind of, um, it has this really, really calming impact to have a really slow procession of people who will bring uh, a very, very low energy into the space, which can obviously, when you're, when you're shutting down parts of a major city, there's a potential for a lot of anger and frustration, things can kick off. We have excellent de-escalation teams that come out with non-violent communication skills who are on hand when things get difficult. But having performance like that in the space can really also help to add to like a, a, a calming and a soothing effect on the environment that we're working in. So that came from lots of iterative work of protest, you know, blocking roads and after some time realizing that the front driver gets so fucked off that they get out of the van and like scream at you. And the way that you can stop them, for example, is to go and give them some cookies. So. <laughs> That's, that's something that we sort of like evolved over time, was like ways in which to deal with anger on the streets. And there are certain things that you can do to sort of try and enhance your chances of not, um, not seeing too much sort of kick off, yeah. Well, I found really impressive was that in terms of <laughs> touch points for Extinction Rebellion, you've got your talk, like the Heading for Extinction, the one hour talk, but also this handbook. So um, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about the idea, because when did you write this book? Um, this is not a drill. Yeah, well, yeah. well I, didn't, I didn't write it. Um, loads of people wrote it. Okay. Me and Miles have a piece uh, in it about making the art factory. But the, um, the concept, well, first of all, Penguin came to us. So we've just answered some questions earlier um, about this. Uh, why did you go with a corporate publisher like Penguin um, when you're you know, all about like smashing the system and liberating everyone? Um, and I think it was a really difficult choice to make, but when they approached us really early on, the guy who commissioned us said, you know, I know that my children and our business are all in grave danger, and I think that you guys are doing something that might work, and I really think it's important that we try to amplify that. And I and others agreed that it was important that they had a reach which we wouldn't get if we self-published, that we wouldn't get if we just put something out online or whatever. And so we took the opportunity, we gathered up a whole load of writers, uh, none of us had ever put a book together before, so we massively overcommissioned it, and it was and it was an amazing set of work, and it was an excruciating editorial process. And then uh, these guys designed it, and it came together super super quickly. And what we wanted to represent within that was people from around the world, their perspectives on what's going on now. Uh, also hear from scientists, also hear from a firefighter in California, also hear from people who've been working in the art department and various other elements so that it was, so that it was like an accessible, easy read, but so it really gave the sort of feel of some of the fundamentals of the thinking behind the movement. And I think it's, I think it's done fairly well at, at doing that. I think for me, it was like a touch point to understand the many nuances and the many faces and people behind Extinction Rebellion and for an outsider to come in and get a sense of like, okay, this is what it could look like for me. And also hear people's nuances and the play and the serving lentils to police and all the kind of day-to-day -day stuff. So maybe we touched on it over dinner, like the different climate here in the Netherlands versus what's happening in the UK. Maybe you can paint a picture for us, like how the movement's changed over the last six months and, and, and what your plans are maybe for 2020 with Extinction Rebellion? Um. <laughs> um. <laughs> That's very brave, making that one up. <laughs> well, I think there's two really important points that we shouldn't like forget. I'm going to say them now because I don't know when the end is. Um, <laughs> none of us know when the end is. Two minutes. So the first is that everything that is done in Extinction Rebellion is an experiment, and uh, the tactics were built up slowly, <laughs> and that, that came in like rising up before we even knew about it. They did stuff. Um, and it was like what, what worked, very kind of scientific, rigorous view of, you know, looking at data and understanding it. That doesn't mean the whole thing is very sciencey, but that's just, uh, that's what's going on. Um, and the other thing that we mustn't forget is that, um, which this is like the punchline, which I'm just making up. <laughs> like Extinction Rebellion is a very specific tool, and all the other movements that were shown earlier are very specific tools, and they're all like, 
aimed at like a specific goal. And like the dream is movement of movements. And that would be like everybody coming together to like make a better world. I mean, that's the only way we can actually do it because you can't just mobilize people about climate. You have to mo mobilize them about, about having a shit job or the fact that, you know, they're going to get flooded and even if they think they can stop the sea, they can't and all that sort of thing. The interrelatedness of life, basically. No, but it's beautiful. I mean, you did a squirm on your face before you said a better world, but like, that is what you're proposing, is that like people, this whole, maybe the, I think the last question I think that people would like to hear about is the regenerative culture element, because I think that is, for at least for me, was new, and I think quite distinct about Extinction Rebellion, and also well, uh, an entry point for people. If our first year was about the existential threat, which it was about, then our second year will be about the regenerative culture. So I guess in many respects it's watch this space, but there's some interesting developments, there's interesting people involved, and maybe that we have to show people exactly what it means to live differently. Maybe we have to create a space, maybe we have to show it to you all and say, look, fuck's sake, this is the way to live, come on, look, this is really good, look, we're living it. Maybe that's what we have to do. But um, we're still making it up. And I mean, just because we're, we're, we're just about to end, are we? We're, so, we're almost done. Yeah, OK. I mean, just, just to bring it back to branding. Yes. Um, I think, <laughs> Don't I think do that. We, when, 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 when we did the initial work, we kind of, we sort of had this all in mind. You, you can't, we knew that we had to cope with disparate people there would be the low-hanging fruit the people who would be most likely to support what we were doing but there would be we needed to talk to people that don't normally get involved in this kind of stuff we needed to talk to people on the left on the right we needed to i mean like you know the that's not that's not new but um but then you know we might need to shift things we might need to kind of like clive's just said you know we're talking about the threat to start with then we have to, to change tack and so um, what, what we did with the colours, with the, with the kind of the messaging and stuff was, was basically to try and provide a framework that would allow us to talk to different people in different ways. But what happens in the second year, I mean, I, I hope is down to, you know, kind of what you guys in the room do. You know, people who are already involved in, in XR, but people who might not yet be. We need you all. And, the, you know, the, 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 the brand is there to be to be picked up and, and run with. Um, that, that toolkit has been downloaded 6,000 times around the world, and we haven't got a clue who's using it. What's happening? It's the complete antithesis of how you do a brand. Um, so please, you know. But very effective. Well, well yeah, we haven't. I mean, weren't we talking about that before? Something. How if, how effective Extinction Rebellion has been? You were recently. Yeah, I, th I think there's something about. Um, well, I think there's something about the simplicity of putting out just a colour scheme and a font and knowing that once that gets a little bit known, you just have to use that on a piece of paper and you go, oh, that's an Extinction Rebellion message. And that's, that's really useful, I think, for, for people everywhere. Um, I just wanted to mention that what I think might be coming this year um, is, um, is, is going to be something about looking at rewiring the global economy. So we've been under some criticism in the past for not saying we're anti-capitalist um, uh, because some of us aren't, basically. And um, you know, and and if you aren't, then you're so welcome. And if you're an anarchist, you're so welcome. And if you're a socialist, you're so welcome. And I'm afraid if you're a Tory, you're still welcome. Um, <laughs> so that's you know, this is. <laughs> How you, this is how you, how you do something which, which is radical, right? Which is going to yeah. say, come on, it's okay, we'll talk to you. Hypocrites, welcome. Come into the space, let's do this together. Because everyone's so sort of deeply affected by living in the systems that we're in. And it feels that you can't do anything outside of it without being called a hypocrite. Uh, for being for not being a total puritan and puritanism is 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 the is going to be the end of like uh doing anything that's like actually tangible and real in terms of getting major change to happen um but so one of the things that we've not approached yet really massively is 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 looking at uh how we affect finance in a big way and i know that there's a draft in process and people are looking this year to engage in some um financial civil disobedience which would be a new awesome. way to 
do something disruptive, which of course can uh, cross borders because the system is, is a global one. And I think um, the majority of the enthusiasm for that is for a debt strike, which would mean that people take out loans and refuse to give them back. And um, you could do that in several different ways, but you might decide that you know some people who need some money and you think, well, I'll give it to them. And, um, so it's like a redistribution of wealth? It's, yeah, it's, it, it acts as a sort of embodiment of redistribution and, and, and giving away. Um, and uh, it's, an, it's a physical embodiment of solidarity because you implicate yourself financially into the hopefully the benefit of somebody who is in in great need financially so it can i think it can speak really well if it's done properly and i know that my friend gail has recently been speaking to some financiers in london about it and when she spoke to them and said we're going to take your money and never give it back again they went fair enough <laughs> so you know people in, people in that sector get it right they 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 know they know that they're that they're part of this like deeply, deeply damaging apparatus, uh, which is, you know, we're, we're just building a new narrative around that, but the, one I, the, the idea that I've seen for sort of explaining this to people is like, the finance system is like the heart, and it pumps the resources around the system, and our system is the body, and it's, and it's, got, a, and it's got an illness, and, and it's pumping, pumping, pumping all this stuff to the wrong place, and it's fueling, it's fueling the cancer cells, it's fueling the things that's making us sick. And we need to do something, we need to make an intervention in that system. So that's, I hope, coming this year. But that's watch awesome. that space. So um, that's definitely been a conversation that we've been having is transparency around, you know, where is the money? But anyway, we have time for two questions. Um, so if anybody has a question, uh, yes, one and two, perfect. Would you be able to run over with the mic? This gentleman here. Oh, anarchy. <laughs> so how would you feel if a traditional brand like Coca-Cola or Nike would adapt your brand? We would sue them. <laughs> so we're about to trademark Extinction Rebellion. We're about to trademark the name Extinction Rebellion. We're trademarking the symbol, the way it sits together, to prevent non-commercial usage. So um, no one commercial. will be able to use the... Uh, sorry, sorry, not non-commercial usage. <laughs> we want non-commercial usage. Sorry, commercial usage. So, but that doesn't stop people appropriating the language we use. So in, in London at the moment, there's loads of people using Rebel as, uh, in advertising and all. There's nothing we can do about that. So on that level, we have to change shit. So we have to change again. We have to stay ahead of the game. And there was another question at the back with this woman here. Hands, please. OK. Um, on that point, uh, Patagonia used, uh, what was it, what, a rebel in one of their recent campaigns, perhaps? Yeah. Did they? There's nothing I we can do so. about that. But it, I mean, also, that's a, that's a brand that's hugely aligned with funding supporting your mission. It, but the, this was you a filler know, question. We, Maybe it's too th there's, <laughs> a, there's, there's a thing like, are we business as usual? Yeah. Or aren't we business as usual? Yeah. And I mean, this is where it becomes difficult because we're using tactics that are obviously from the commercial sector, but we're using them against themselves. So, I mean, you know, the purpose of what we're doing is not business as usual. Yeah. So even though Patagonia might do good things, um, I, I still don't think it's good. But it's very also, difficult. I like the fact that they're people. When people start using the language that we're using, that means we're beginning to succeed as well. But it also means we have to change the language. Yeah. So we all make like personal changes. Like, I'm not going to fly. I try not to. I'm kind of like verging on vegan mostly, and like, because they're important, but they're not going to change anything really on a global scale. Like in the same way, a business like greenwashing itself or even like making, you know, moderate changes is not going to actually affect like what's happening to the planet. Because what's happening to the planet is, I mean, global is like an understatement. It's like a geophysical, the whole organism of the planet is changing extremely fast. And it's kind of possible that we can't alter that trajectory. It's possible that all the um, 
tipping point's been passed. But if we have got a chance to actually alter that trajectory, it's or it's like it has to be done like nationally by governments and you know maybe all the governments to actually affect to make that big effect. Yep. We okay. had a question at the back. <laughs> we do have a question in the, in the back. What I did want to point out before I passed on um, the mic was that I wanted to especially thank you to Extension Rebellion and the book Branded Protest in particular is that this collective, as far as a group of people, has come from various nationalities, cultures, and mindsets. And that's what the book was about. And I failed to ask the gentleman who asked the first question where he was from. But I'm going to pass the mic over to Caitlin, who's actually here from the Netherlands, who has, actually has a question. So, yep. Okay, cool. Awesome. Sorry. Great. Sorry, hand. okay. <laughs> I can't take the mic out of his hand. Sorry. Um, my question um, is actually, um, uh, well, for all of you, I guess. But um, uh, so the book actually mentioned a few key sort of ingredients, um, like, uh, you know, body symbol message. Um, in your opinion, um, what would be some key ingredients of a, a successful branded protest or an effective radical campaign? Good question. Being really fucking organized <laughs> is like the main, is the main ingredient, I think. And, and having people who are willing to take this work and act professionally about it, like people chucking in their jobs, <clears throat> people giving up on uh, their careers and uh, heading down to an office every day and struggling through to try and pull something together which sometimes you have some money in the bank and sometimes you have no money in the bank and you just carry on organizing and making sure that you keep on getting stuff together. And the, the beginning of Extinction Rebellion, I think a lot of people don't know, started with people touring the UK, giving this talk, heading for extinction and what to do about it. And at the end of the talk, you had three boxes that you could tick on a form that went round and it said, would you be willing to help get arrested or face a prison sentence? And that was the ask. So, you know, we weren't shy about going out and saying we're going to organise mass participation in really, really peaceful law breaking and we need you to sign up to it. And from that moment, then you have a, a database of a small number of people who you know are going to be dedicated to go out and demonstrate that. And the demonstration effect causes more people to join and see what's going on. So I think irrespective of whether or not we'd have dressed it as, as well as we did in the first protests that we ever did, I was, I was so proud of the work that everyone did because they did look totally beautiful. But you know, that, that's the most important piece of the work is the dedication and the hours that you put into mobilizing people, organizing them, and making sure that you have a really, really, really good culture of working together. Uh, the way that you hold yourself in spaces, the way you talk to each other, the way you have meetings, um, all of that kind of stuff. So that's, that's like the number one I, for me. That's, I think that echoes that first question about how do you build a distributed network as well as that, to be really professional, like you've said, but that culture of being able to trust. And we know that we came from a, we came from a place of trust because we'd already worked with each other. But the, um, <clears throat> one of the most amazing things for me, and I think for a lot of people that get involved in XR, is you immediately are able to trust people that you, have, you didn't know yesterday. Mm. And that's amazing. So you can trust them to... <clears throat> to to accept you and your ideas and to take your you know everybody builds on each other's work you know ideas turn up and you run with them and I think that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say the first thing you need is like numbers, but I mean, Extinction Rebellion has never had like amazing numbers, but it's got kind of expertise in a lot of areas. It's like quite a, I mean, it seems to be working quite well like that. But I mean, if you want to live in a livable world, and if you want your children to live in a livable in a livable world. You're all going to have to get out on the streets. And also, you've got amazing brand values, right? Really clear brand values so that people know when they come and join Extinction Rebellion the kinds of behaviours or mindsets that the movements... But there's also, you know, just to add... Yeah, there's, there's another thing. That when, when you're starting something, don't think what you're doing is new. Because all the problems 
that we faced with Extinction Rebellion have been faced throughout our human history by other people addressing different problems. So before you start looking forwards, look backwards, because you learn an awful lot of lessons from the past. And most of what you see in front of you here are lessons learned from the past, not from the future. That's really awesome and really powerful. Thank you so much for this impromptu interview. <laughs> Um, I had a question to, for the Extinction Rebellion art group. Um, you were talking about like looking into the past and learning about it, and I see some really nice references with, for instance, the design of the punk movement and the designer, uh, I forgot his name, but it was designing uh, the graphics, but also Viviana Westwood. Bauhaus. <laughs> Have you been um, looking into the past and seeing what worked and didn't work, and, and have you been using that and, inf and bringing it to this generation? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, the Bauhaus is a huge influence, obviously, the, 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 last, the last paragraph of the manifesto, we do a lecture, and that's a major part of the lecture. Um, they you know, personally on my life, they've been a massive influence. I think, you know, we, we have a, we firmly believe that, um, that design at the moment is, because it is so co coerced by the commercial sector that, and so based on the desire for predictability and certainty that capitalism needs for profit that um, actually we need lots of uncertainty and the Bauhaus sort of embraced the uncertainty after the First World War and really ran with it and reinvented the whole system. And, you know, I think sometimes design needs to reconnect itself with its greater past that we've been slightly disconnected from. And um, we have to remember design is part of a social output and we're part of something else. We're not something on its own to one side that talks only to itself. And so I think amongst those, the suffragettes were a major influence, situationists. I mean, some of them more obvious. Punk, less so, bizarrely, because it has <laughs> difficulties <laughs> in our country. That up. <laughs> That's, uh, the, the punk thing's quite interesting. Uh, there's something that Clive and I have spent a lot of time talking about. Um, Clive was, uh, he was like a break dancer. It's hard. And, uh, and like, where, where, whereas I was, yeah, he's still got it. He's still, he'll do it later if we have enough time. Um, and whereas I, I was more punk. And so we've, we've kind of, we've talked a lot about this. And I think, um, I think there's there's a there's a lot of the um, the punk attitude that that kind of comes through, and I think I think what what the for, for me I think the, the way the, the punk thing comes through is the situationism. So that's you know kind of Malcolm McLaren being inspired by May '68 and the Atelier Populaire, and that kind of again it's that sort of repeating of history. Um, and then just to come back to one of the earlier questions that we had, um, the one thing that's really important for, for me about the punk thing is to not get co-opted because the moment you've got the moment you can buy the kit out of a catalogue, the moment you can you know you can just like dress without actually fucking doing something is the, is the moment that it it then becomes um, much more difficult. And I mean, we could talk about this all night probably, but you know, that's, 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 that's our take. But we all have to come from different places, I guess. Yeah, so what has, yeah, so what has totally failed <laughs> is what people call Western democracy. It's just ended up with like two party states, red and blue, left and right. And it's, you know, it's um, destroyed the planet. And what, whether you call it that, whether you call it neoliberal capitalism, whatever, that's all fucked. That doesn't work. Um, and what happens if you actually give people power and information? So what XR do is like try and encourage citizens' assemblies to be run. And if you take people and you give them critical, you teach them critical thinking, bring them together. You double their wages, give them a year to like work on a project, bring them all your experts, then um, they are way, normal people are way much better than you would think. And they're way much better than any politician because obviously politicians are only there because they want glory, fame, money, whatever. And um, even if you fuck up citizens' assemblies, they still work extremely well. So 
get involved, get on the streets, join your local community councils or if you have those sorts of things, because that's the only way you're going to ever make a better world. Um, Extinction Rebellion, Clive, Russell, um, Charlie, Clear, what I'd love to know, like, what is it about? Because I saw some overlaps with what Thomas had to say, with also what the values that you're perpetuating, they seem to be coming from different places, but I'd love to know if there was something that resonated that there was a collaborative kind of point of similarity from what Thomas was saying to what you guys are sharing. Yeah, well, the thing that I was talking about, me and Miles doing this closing project was the, the big word that we worked with was empathy. And um, that was from us sort of putting together some thoughts initially from what we were reading um, and what we were interested in and what we thought that we wanted to have more conversations about. And so we started to like get counterfeit goods from recycling factories that were going to be incinerated and overprint over the branding the word empathy and print patches with the word empathy on them and paint the word empathy on the back of jackets. And, and that went on and on. And the other words that came uh, that we really focused on were compassion, solidarity, some, I describe these words as a bit unfashionable, sometimes humility, frugality. Um, we, we really wanted to like open conversations about those topics and I guess you came at it from a sort of like scientific study perspective and we came at it from a like our hearts wanted to do it perspective, mm -hmm. but putting something out that felt that it was less anti and more pro something. Yeah. Um, which doesn't mean that you don't then have to go out and be absolutely, uh, you know, resistant. It doesn't mean that you don't have to go out and like embody risk and cost people a massive uh, inconvenience and get in the way and cause trouble and be disruptive. Like, I think that's completely necessary. But what... What I think Extinction Rebellion has been trying to do so far in the way that we put ourselves together on the streets is to embody um, something peaceful, something of a sort of preemptive non-violence because we know that the conditions that lay ahead are so ripe for fascist leaders and we know that we're seeing the fortressing of rich countries. We know that the strong men are, uh, are getting elected you know, uh, fascists win elections, you know, that's how they get in more often than not. And we can see it coming down the road. And as you said, people like saying never again. They used to like saying that. They don't say it very much anymore and they certainly don't fucking act like it. So if you can see those conditions ahead where you think that there's gonna be more and more likelihood of that turning out to be your lived political reality, what are you doing about it now? And I think a preemptive movement that popularizes and educates people on nonviolence through speech, behavior, and through education, then I think that's like crucially important. So I do think like that's really where the overlap comes for awesome. me listening to him talk. Protest movements don't necessarily like, you know, make money, but I at least want to like be able to they, um buy a, a package of ramen noodles at the end of the day. So how are you guys doing this shit? You know, that's my question. There, there's a really simple, really simple, concise answer. I mean, actually, don't, you know, the thing is, we'll we're not jobs. asking people to give up their one. jobs. <laughs> yeah. We're not asking people to give up their jobs. We're asking people to take their principles to work. Exactly. And, and that's a slightly different thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, okay, in Extinction Rebellion, we say, look, the end is, is going to, everything's going to, you know, we're all going to die and all of that. But the point is, we are all products of the system that we live in. We didn't choose to be born into the system that we've been born into, but we've been born into that system. The thing is to take, though, the principles that you feel, use your heart. And I, I've been told as a designer, uh, stop thinking with your head, think with your heart. Start thinking with your heart, you know, stop thinking with your head. Take your principles to work. You know, it's really simple. That's the starting point. That's the part of the journey. Obviously, we live in a dig digital age, and you all did amazing work on the streets and, like, just in real life, let's put it that way. So I was just wondering, have you ever considered, like, a digital form of protest? Like, because, obviously, the younger generations, like millennials or Gen Z, um, they do a lot in the digital space. And I was just wondering if you ever thought about it, maybe Amnesty International or Extinction Rebellion. 
I think there's a problem right now with people that they think that the digital space is like equivalent to the real world and it is totally not. So what the digital space can do is connect us and share ideas really fucking fast. What it can't do is like affect the power relations out there in the big bad world, which mm -hmm. is what people need to get to grips with and get out there and deal with. So it's very easy to have values at work. It's very easy to have values in your business. It's very easy to have values on the internet, but it's not so easy to have the courage to go out and embody those values against what the main status quo is telling you to do and what not to do. And that's what everyone needs to do is go and find the courage to go and live out in the real world and actually represent those values rather than just go, well, I'm on the right side because I click the right things and I like those things and I sometimes share the right message, right? Because it doesn't actually change anything. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I saw a clip of uh, Greta at the World Economic Forum in uh, Davos, and she was telling everybody off. She's really good at that. Um, I'd really like to know what you would do if you were standing in that room. Are you going to use empathy? Are you going to tell them we're fucked? Um, how are you going to, because you know, you're in the belly of the beast there. How are you going to make real change there? Uh, I think, actually, to believe that Davos can make any real change is to misunderstand the actual power structures that, that guide humanity. Because you are then investing you, your thoughts and your ideas and your hope for change in the wrong people. Because actually real change doesn't happen in places like Davos. It happens at the grassroots level. And it also happens in places like Rojava. And it happens in other places in the world which are, are feeling more extreme pressure than we're feeling. So, you know, you look to places like Davos, you look to billionaires, you look to your Elon Musks to save humanity. That's not going to happen. The, the change is, is within ourselves, within our own communities, and at a very smaller grassroots level. Our, their power comes from us. It's not the other way around. Um, Extinction Rebellion is on the list of terrorists in the United Kingdom. Does it influence your actions in the future? You are a terrorist. Uh... We're not actually. <laughs> we aren't actually no, on the list. we read that. So can so you explain how it did come in our newspapers then? Greenpeace are also on the same list, but it was uh, a dysfunctional. Sorry, it was a dysfunctional list. So uh, it might be a political. It depends on which whether you're. It depends on your standpoint. It's either political maneuvering um, from the current government, from Boris Johnson and his crew, uh, to try and scare us. Um, but also, it's, it's a massive error in policing. So the police aren't quite that organised, unsurprisingly. So I don't know. Your take is different. The prevent program that it was included in is a really controversial piece of work by the police, which has like contributed to um, a lot of communities feeling extremely vulnerable, particularly uh, Muslim communities in our country, who've been, um, you know, feeling under under the threat of being sort of blanket labelled potential terrorists because of the PREVENT programme, which is designed to go into institutions and schools and make sure that people are aware of the signs of radicalisation so that they can spot them early. So there was a page included in that booklet that they put together of like neo-Nazi symbols and violent movements that were trying to get people to go out and enact physical violence. And then there was a page of non-violent, peaceful environmental movements that was just put in there, and then when they were questioned about it, the police said, oh, but that page doesn't say that they're extremists. That page just, just is in there as well, <laughs> just so that they can see some more symbols. And then they've retracted it, and then it was in the news that actually it was true that we were on the, on the counter-terror list, and then it's been retracted again. And so I think what's interesting about that is basically that they don't know how to handle us. And that's actually quite important, I think, to be able to do what it is that we're trying to do, is that you don't want to become a thing that people can handle, and they go, oh, you're just that thing, and you sit in that box, and then we can make you irrelevant, because we can find precisely the way to target you and make sure that you don't matter anymore. So if you're a movement of, like, doctors and lawyers and tourists, and 
children and mothers and uh, all kinds of different people and you can show that you're like representative of many different parts of walks of life and you show that like non-violent discipline on the streets then I think it becomes very difficult to say what precisely we are and for sure I mean I'm certain by the way that I'm on like loads of lists and that uh, people know exactly where I am all the time and listen to my phone calls and that we've like a lot of us have got no privacy left um, and we'll never know that for sure, I'm, I'm certain, unless we hear our phone calls in court at some point in the future, which could also happen. Um, but, that's, but the point is that I think it's an error from the police, but also they, it's because they don't know what to do. And they did this, and in October, when they put the public order section on the whole of central, the whole of Greater London, which meant that basically two or more people was an assembly, which was then illegal. So that was set down to last the rest of that two weeks that we'd said we'd be in rebellion. It criminalised every single member of our movement who went out on the street with more than another person mm -hmm. with them and made them liable to immediate arrest. Okay, so that's a massive infringement of people's right to uh, public assembly and protest and actually just to cross bridges. People were IDing uh, young people crossing bridges. Um, so that then got chucked out in the courts and that was found to be an illegal act by the police to do that blanket ban. And at that point, all the Democrats came out on the street. You know, loads of people from different political parties came out and got in the streets with us and members of the Green Party were uh, famously arrested. So that kind of thing, not knowing how to shut it down because it is so legitimate, because it is so peaceful, and because it has so much support, they're kind of desperate measures, which I think, you know, they say first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Like, it's good that it's getting harder for us because otherwise we're not making any progress. Mm -hmm. You left out and joined you. <laughs> <laughs> I was really wondering about um, everything that has been said and the centrality of the term branding, because of course there's been like signs and symbols from from the first people, um, and that's always how we've communicated. But brands are synonymous, have grown hand in hand, and branding as a profession has grown hand in hand with consumerism, with the need to create a, a group that is in and that consumes the right things and that's out and then you can identify yourselves as with the people that is in, right, that are in. And aside from what has been said by Extinction Rebellion, I'm getting the impression that essentially we're just trying to redistribute the furniture in the house. Like we're not trying to take down the master's house at all. We just want to be like, right, let's do our jobs, let's spend one day a week doing the right thing, let's put the right badge on. Um, how do we fundamentally, and I don't know if, and I think the guy with the Stripes has said it, that it will come from this room because we are not on the fringes of anything, right? The people who are mostly going to achieve change are the ones who are excluded, not the ones who are lauded. Um, so what do we, what can you say is our role in genuinely sort of dismantling the master's house rather than sort of putting the right logo on the front door? That's the thing, isn't it? Of the you, you won't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools, which I think. I mean, I don't really understand. I'm not. I'm not kind of well read enough to, to fully understand that. But we're certainly using some of those tools in what we're doing. Um, I don't know what the answer is, but and I think the. But I think the, the, the there's a picture that that's probably the nearest I get to, to hope. Um, that I think flashed up. Um, during during the bit when we were talking, and it's like half a dozen Palestinian kids who were holding up handmade placards and it said Palestinian rights are human rights. It talked about being like the Bedouin and it had our fucking logo on it. And um, we're not going to... Yeah, of course I want everybody in this bloody room to, to get involved, but it will be those half dozen Palestinian kids that, that take the master's house down of that, I'm sure. Does that answer your question? Yeah, know. actually, well, I don't, just, my just, beef uh, isn't with XR at all. I think, actually, you are self-aware enough of what you can do, and you are taking extraordinary risks. I'm in awe of what you do. I took my stepson to one of the camps in Marble Arch, and we felt deeply that it wasn't... Uh, 
a place, well, particularly for a 13-year-old uh, black kid from South London, he didn't feel like that was a place for him, but I still think it is absolutely important that ex it exists. What I don't want to suggest to him is that he should go and get a degree in some kind of design and that his way of contributing, because I think you've already said that he needs to be on the street. I was just looking, perhaps from the other panelists, from a bit of the kind of self-awareness that there is something that we can do, but I actually, um, you know, the, the privilege that we all have and the way we're sat here today is not where the radical change is going to be coming from because, you know, yeah, writing books about branding is perhaps not the way that we're going to achieve it. Is it futile? Absolutely not. But I just was missing, sitting really frustratedly at the back, um, a sense that uh, our contribution was could be more meaningful and that we needed to challenge ourselves a bit more than just kind of use my graphic design skills in a slightly more, you know, And we have to remember where the term... The beef you have is with our movement, aren't theirs? <laughs> so, the we term, can't offer that. The term branding, go, go, go. where it comes from as well, need, you know, we need to remember that. Because hmm. it's not, it's a really negative term. You don't, you, don't, you don't brand something that's not positive. You brand an animal, you brand a slave. You brand, you know, this is a really, it's about ownership. The term branding is a term for ownership. You know, so we have to examine all of those things. We have to examine our language, the language that we use. You know, these are really negative things. You mentioned about, um, you, you know, I think it was Roger Hallam that was talking about it's okay to have values and a lot, everybody here will have values, but what's most important is courage. And of course that comes easier to everybody here because of where we live. Every, most people in Europe and America, you know, the, the, the system is quite forgiving. But does, is Extinction Rebellion kind of finite in, in what it can touch? I mean, I'm thinking about like oil companies. There's a big thing about Shell and BP here, but nobody ever mentions kind of Saudi Aramco or a gas bomb in, in Russia, and they're giants and nobody can touch them. How, f what influence do we have ultimately when there is so much of the world that is under autocratic rule, where people can't get out in the streets? Um, somebody mentioned the Palestinian boys, but you know, that's risky. So what can we change without these other countries? They're getting stricter. Saudi, you know, as time goes on, is there hope there? Thank you. You'll be pleased to know that I do know people who talk about Aramco um, <laughs> uh, in, in, in activist world. Um, uh, so, well, it's really difficult, isn't it? Because acting as a citizen of a really privileged nation uh, where you recognise that your own political power lies and that's where you go out and do what you're doing. Uh, for me, that feels very finite. It feels very limited. I know that I'm limited by myself and I know that I'm limited by the system that I live in. I know that I'm limited by my country that I live in for the impact that I can make so far. It doesn't feel that the global overhaul is <laughs> clearly in sight where we, where we can fix all of the world's problems all at once. So I agree that it is really challenging to look at it that way. Um, but I think there's a perspective which is interesting to think about when we talk about these issues and talk about other places where it's perhaps more um, high risk to be engaged in activism or to be engaged in, in trying to make change. Um, and that is that people have always done that in those places anyway. And there are people all over the world struggling to try and make a difference who are at risk of being disappeared or raped or murdered. I'm, I've met activists recently who've told me, when I go out and do protest, if I get arrested, I, women these are, I absolutely believe that there's a minimum 50% chance that I will be raped by my arresting officer. And that's a lived reality, right, for lots and lots of people around the world where, where we look from our position and go, isn't it awful, isn't it so dangerous for those people? 
but they're still doing it. They're still doing it and they've always been doing it and people in those conditions do still continue to fight. It doesn't just often disappear. And there are cases where people can have uh, successful movements in those conditions where people are looking at our social and political conditions and saying, you can never win in these conditions because people are never going to get off the street, off their ass and get out on the street enough, in enough numbers. People aren't angry enough. They're not facing enough adversity. They're not dissatisfied enough with the situation that they're in. So you're never going to build a movement with that strength. Well, you can see in different social conditions that different things become possible. So I don't think it's necessary to look at situations and describe things as, as not possible just based on those, on those facts alone. Um, but what I do think that we need to work towards is a kind of radical cooperation with people around the world and across borders, the likes of which people in power have never seen before. And the example from XR, which I hope people are going to carry on working on, is um, when XR youth in London did some actions at an embassy um, and the children in that country did actions at the British Embassy in their country and they realized that they could do they could make this sort of like pincer movement on their on their uh, international relations so you could cause a sort of a, a democratic crisis potentially if you could apply enough pressure that way and I think people around the world if they're in connection with one another more and more closely understanding like the alignment of their struggles then there is much possibility with the digital time that we live in and the connectedness that we've got and the speed of that communication that there is room for like a lot of innovation in that space I'm not saying that's precisely the tactic but there's a lot of like young people out there around the world who've got common purpose now in the youth strikes and all the movements so I would think that there's hopefully ways that people can find better ways to support each other to make the global movement much more solid together um, if you know what I mean but I don't think I've seen anybody come forward with the tactics and all the answers in how to do that and like to make it really really effective.